Well, welcome everyone to this uh, Cantafire interview with Alexei Saknin. Alexei is a socialist and an activist in the Russian anti-war uh, movement. So thanks very much, um, Alexei, for finding the time to speak to us today. I know time's tight, so uh, you being able to uh, undertake this interview is much uh, appreciated. I want, therefore, to start, if I may, by going directly to the heart of the matter and asking you about the Russian anti-war movement, because for many of us here in the UK, um, and I think the West more generally, seeing Russians demonstrating against the war gave us a real boost uh, as we ourselves demonstrated here in London against the UK government's warmongering. So, could I ask you then to talk a bit about the initial anti-war demonstrations in Russia, but also, of course, about the subsequent repression the movements uh, suffered? You know, to, to understand what is going on around uh, anti-war movement in Russia and what is the distance between anti-war movement in our country and in Western Europe, the best source is uh, repressive statistics, police statistics. Just during the first months of that war, which we are not allowed to call the war, it's a criminal article. There were more than 15,000 um, demonstrants were arrested. It's quite a lot. It's quite a lot, and during these two months, there were a few dozen of criminal cases uh, against uh, against all type of people. Uh, Middle-aged woman from Arkhangelsk who commented in uh, tip Facebook for our in group with hundred people of people few anti-war even not statements comments she she is risking now by 10 years of prison young people old people poor middle class famous politicians no names all types of people and that create the atmosphere of scare i never i lived in russia many years as you can see in my bad English. But uh, I never felt something comparable. They create atmosphere of incredible scare, fear, panic. During the first two weeks, the consumption of antidepressant medicine, antidepressive medicine, grew up in four and a half times, four and a half. Uh, in the beginning, <clears throat> this war, it was much more shock new for Russians than even for Europeans. You can compare, you know, the most peacemakers environment, left activists and so on, who for years promised to their society that no, Putin is a rational dictator. He would not jump to the hell. It has nothing to do with uh, common sense. And then Putin jumped. It's more or less what society here felt last weeks and months. Besides this, few weeks after war had begun, there were quite remarkable uh, mobilizations, street mobilizations, and against war. I've been in almost all of them, which took place in Moscow, where I'm living. And let me try to draw a picture how it looked like. So all city center is uh, blocked by police. Some subway stations does not work. So you're not able to come up from subway directly in the place where manifestation should take place. Then if you're coming, all streets are closed with uh, 
police buses and uh, thousands of you know special police units they does not allow people to 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 just meet in one place they split demonstrators from the beginning so it's even difficult to count how many of us you just mark that almost all people around are or demonstrators or policemen but in any case it was something few thousand people each time it's much less than biggest protest demonstration of last few years the biggest during 10 years, it was 10 years ago, there was huge protest demonstrations with 120,000, 140,000 pro probably uh, uh, participants. But even last few years, the war demonstration with uh, 30 or 40,000 people. Now it was between five and 10. Mm -hmm. It's quite clean why. First of all, it was the war happened suddenly. Then all structures of opposition, both liberal and left and even nationalistic, was destroyed quite brutally during last 10 years. The all political leaders are in prison, in immigration, and their structures, which theoretically could organize and mobilize people on demonstration were totally destroyed. And the last one was Alexei Navalny uh, structure, political movement, which was destroyed one year ago, spring 21. Mm. Then media landscape have changed dramatically. Uh, for all these years, we had quite big oppositional media environment which was indeed much much more important than political parties and movements themselves so information circulized in this quite big but still liberal information bubble mm. it was destroyed the last big media was destroyed already in March, but the huge step was made one year ago as well, when almost all independent media, liberal one, were uh, um, recognized as a foreign agents. Mm. Their business models were destroyed. They have to follow kind of self-censorship and real censorship for them to retreat all the time. Mm -hmm. So that information, inf inform uh, informational mobilization was also destroyed. In and finally, as I said, that atmosphere of scare and fear, incredible which was created by extremely aggressive statements of Putin and his uh, narrow circle, by the terrible repressive laws which were stamped by parliament during the first week of war, by demonstrative repressive cases and arrests. So that atmosphere make participation in demonstration, you know, real challenge. You have to be very mood. Oh. My second language is Swedish because after big demonstrations 10 years ago, I lived for six years as a political refugee in Sweden. So um, you have to be very strong man, very brave. In that circumstances, five or 10,000 on street in first days was quite a lot. 
few times. Yes, I was just. And it was not that, only in Moscow. I was. This is. This is. I mean, that that point to me is 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 particularly important. And what I wanted perhaps to to, to perhaps ask you a little bit more about is what is your sense of the degree of support that the war actually does have we will come to this. russian society we will come to this yes just i want you said that i uh, i'm free to speak as long as i want and of course I, I want you to are. speak all the time <laughs> it's much uh, it became as long as you don't mind me interrupting you occasionally with a question yes you are welcome absolutely Excellent. good carry on but i mean who were these people who demonstrate in Moscow, Petersburg, or Rostov streets mm. during March months? It was not only, but mostly the heart of that protest mobilization was educated middle class. Mm. Many quite young people, I mean, not schoolers, as our propaganda used to say, but, you know, 20, 25 years. In general, this is uh, exactly the heritage of that liberal media mobilization, which was the monopolist of political thinking during the last 10 years. All over these 10 years, I was quite hard critic of that liberal mobilization not just only because of that ideological characteristics, but also because it's structure. As a big bubble of quite privileged people, they mobilize inside, but they mobilize outside. Mm. So people from all other, all other type of social environment poor people from province and even poor people from Moscow and people of other type of mentality or political views, other worldwide was not welcomed in that environment. As a result, they were totally demobilized. They had no any poll, any poll to, to be close to, to organize around. So people who demonstrate in Moscow, they were representatives, legitimate representatives of uh, educated middle class, Europeanized, westernized middle class of big cities. But uh, it sounds probably quite banal. Pro I, 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 I'm not sure, but probably it would sound quite banal in uh, uh, Western media landscape. But in Russian landscape, it's still, you know, shock new. Uh, it's uh, shock content. Sociological research, even made by loyal to Kremlin agencies, showed that there is a very clean and quite impressive uh, correspondence, correlates between level of income and level of support of that special military operation. If the, the, the biggest level of support is between middle class, is a between most uh, wealth group of population. Mm -hmm. As more poor person is, as more poor and suppressed he feel himself, as less chance that he would support Putin's intervention. That is the biggest paradox and the biggest drama sociological, let's say, drama in uh, agenda of uh, anti-war movement. These groups, people, these narratives, which are really working, which mobilize people on streets, are totally not heard. They are totally not acceptable in that social environment that is really scaring a war or social 
последствия, social, what is coming from war? Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, social results of war. Uh, poverty, unemployment, inflation. And uh, <clears throat> that, of course, is a heritage of our political culture and how contemporary Russia had uh, evolutionate for all 30 years. Okay, can I, it, that, that, that's very interesting. What, can, I, in, can I just, in my head, summarize what it is you're saying here? You're saying mm -hmm. that actually... Just a second, Liz. It's just uh, noisy. Mm? No worry. Um, uh, 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 what you're effectively saying is that there is a big gulf between those who are mobilizing the demonstrations and the mass of the population who are very worried about the war and the social consequences of the war, but they're not being mobilized into those demonstrations. Is that, exactly. that's effectively what you're saying. Yes. What about the role of the, is anybody doing anything, I mean, in terms of the left to try to bridge that gulf and, and, and what efforts are being made to kind of, I know it's difficult and I, I understand that completely, but I'm just wondering whether the efforts are being made to kind of overcome that gulf. Yes, yeah, sure. It's our main goal and what we are trying to do. But as you said, and it's totally correct, it's not easy. Mm. Uh, first of all, let I answer on your previous question about how people really react on war. According loyalist sociology, and it's almost all sociology, almost all pollsters now are more tool of propaganda than uh, kind of research. But according to them, it's like 78 or something, 76% of population support that bloody shit. And that is something, you know, which force you to, to doubt. Because if everybody support war, where are the, all this everybody? First day of war, I am as a journalist, just went out from my house and I took, um, take a walk near the cluster, the most conservative cluster of Russian Orthodox Church, where very, let's say, usual, regular people used to circulate around. Mm -hmm. People from province, I mean, not educated, most religious, who supposed to be most conservative, the most Putin um, audience. And I asked like 40 people. And there was just one guy who repeat some patriotic cliche from propaganda. All other 39 was against war. Mm -hmm. It's not true that there, are, there is no any support to war. It would be too much. It's not the truth. But it's much less than majority. That is for sure. We have uh, not enough sources to, for analysis, but some sources we have. There are four or five um, big governmental pollsters or connect close to government uh, pollsters. There is one independent research and there are, let's say, um, everyday experience we have as well. And we have, let's say, focus groups. So what we can uh, be almost sure that we have two polls with around quarter of population on each. Quarter of population more or less consciously support the war. But the, you know, real enthusiasm and real energy of support is just between five and 10%. This is very understandable people, ideological nationalists, sometimes Stalinist, Stalinist sometimes left nationalists, but more often typical, you know, right-wing nationalists, imperialists, Russia from Atlantic to Pacific Ocean and so on, Tsarist Empire. So ideological idiots, let's say. Um, 
former military officers. They often work as uh, taxi drivers. So sometimes you can meet them. The middle age or like 55 years old uh, guy with a big stomach with some... Okay, you recognize he probably spent 25 years on uh, casernes. So they often support, not always, but often they support war. Mm. Or it's, uh, it's bureaucrats, career bureaucrats, or um, businessmen connected with administrations, local administrations. They used to support war because that war conservate their privilege and their style of life. Not with such energy, but part of budget workers also support war. Let's say bureau, uh, small bureaucrats, regular bu bureaucrats, or even like um, administration of person who work in administration of school. They depend of, on power and each school organized as a huge hierarchy. In the top, they got quite a lot. Teachers, not this much. But as, my, as, as much person is near to power, as more chances that he would support war more or less consciously. Yes, yes. Then there is a quarter who are totally against war. We knew that women are majority in that quarter. Very understandable. Uh, youth is very much against war. More than half, even according to Kremlin's propaganda, in the youngest uh, group of population. And as I said before, poor people used to be against war. And then separately, this uh, educated like students and intelligence in big cities, they are part of middle class, but that part who are against war usually. Uh, and between these two poles, we have about half of population, probably even more, 60 percent. When person from that 60 percent majority meets the interviewer from sociological agency, they have dialogue like do you support uh, decision of our president Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin to send our army in the uh, limited military, special military operation to demilitarize and denazifize denazification of Ukraine? Mm. So first message is this is decision of his majesty. In authoritarian country, it's quite important message. In a current atmosphere of scare, it's also scary message. So big chance that person would answer yes. But then if you will ask him some other questions, answers would be, could, may, could be a surprise. For example, if you would answer, if you would be in a Putin's shoes, which kind of decision would you choose? And then list of decisions. Nuclear weapon on London, the capital of Great Britain. <laughs> Thank you. No, no. <laughs> yes, I see, yes. Uh, uh, military intervention in any, you know, very moderate uh, form, like, Special military operation, blah, blah, blah. 15, 20% already after it had happened. But then like most part of uh, respondents would choose very moderate answers. Diplomatic pressure, um, discussions uh, to, to broke diplomatic relations and whatever not violence. Um, <clears throat> that is 
huge problematic and I am of course not able to you know make it extremely clean directly now mm -hmm. in that interview but there is a moral level very important uh, if you recognize war as a war aggressive war conquer conquering Aggr aggression against the nearest people in the world the third part of russian have relatives in ukraine almost all have friends i don't know students um, comrades and so on classmates it's the same as as putin said it's the same nation it, it it's probably not the same nation but i mean it's very close society mm. millions of tens if you recognize that we attack that nearest society who thinking as we living in the same soviet style cities have the same style of life same mentality even same language mm. it should destroy your worldview the only one important case of common memory is that we are the nation who uh, who have who keep the heritage of anti-fascist resistance be free also i mean uh, emancipation of the world internationalism and you have to recognize that we are in the shoes of fascist uh, country and that means as well that you have been wrong all that 30 years or 20 years at least when you vote for putin for example or vote for all other parties who also support the war or did not participate in um, demonstrate then everything is mistake Alexa, then, can, can and I... also it means that you have to do something and to do what yes. in the most atomized society I would just wanted to just step in, if I may, at this point. Sure, sure. Uh, and and perhaps, uh, I mean, what you've provided is a is a, is a very interesting, uh, concrete assessment of the anti-war movement, the the wider um, uh, attitude of Russians to the war. It's very interesting, and um, uh, uh, but what you're pointing to, as as I see it, is you're pointing to. Um, the potential that does exist in Russian society for a wider opposition to the war and to Vladimir Putin at the same mm -hmm. time. And it, it seems to me clear, however, that that will also depend to a degree upon how the war goes in Ukraine. And I was just wondering at this point, if you could provide from your perspective, how you see the war has gone in Ukraine for Russia so far, and what you think the current military situation, uh, how it stands, in your opinion, as far as you can tell, I know it's difficult, as far as you can tell in Ukraine at the moment. First of all, it's a criminal uh, article in the Criminal Codex of Russian Federation. It called in our circumstances the fake news and uh, there's information about Russian army abroad up to 15 years. So I will try, I'm speaking openly. I will try to, to not disinform you about Russian army abroad. <laughs> Good, I'm grateful. It was very interesting uh, episode in a, in a TV channel Zvezda, the star. The star is a TV channel of Russian military uh, defense ministry. Quite popular. Uh, there was some talk show and all speakers, of course, was 150% on the side of no war no war we used to call it in order to not call it war you know um and then one of guests in studio got 
microphone and he was an officer like veteran in all medals and and he said like you know i want to ask you about a minute of silence in honor of those our guys our officers who are dying there in ukraine now because they're heroes and dying in the name of saint russia and so on and it became the fantastic scandal to uh, how do you say the, the person who led the show who ran the show he started to just shut on him. Shut up, shut up. What are you saying? Shut up. Nobody is dying. No, it's just triumph of the Russian weapons. I can send you the link or you can Google it yourself. It was quite, became quite famous meme in uh, Telegram. Uh, but it probably shows that the triumph of the Russian weapon is going not in a way which was expected by those who organize that fucking triumph. It became more and more clear. I totally agree with mainstream description. And now it's like banal thing that like Volga is coming to Caspian Sea and war does not goes according to the first plan. Mm. Mm. Uh, first days, official TV and all propagandistic apparatus did not knew what to say. They had no, you know, they call it temniks. The list with uh, aims, with, uh, with subjects of propagandistic subjects, theses and arguments with journalists or from loyalist media have to use. So they did not got Temniks, such a list, first time for many years. It was just what to say. And they were speaking about, I don't know, local news in Novokuznetsk. Or just official natural reports. Uh, because those... Uh, Gentlemen who organized that fantastic special military operation, they were sure that in a few days they will finish like they finished with Georgia 2008, mm. or with Crimea 2013, 14. After a week, they have to write all the Temniks. Uh, but yes, one, one historical job. I'm historian by my education and you know, in uh, historical school books for many years, there was a meme, there was a like cliche, which come from one book to each other from Lenin's time to current days. Russia came to the war unprepared. Because to each war in its history, Russia came unprepared. I guess this no war would describe with that um, cliche very clean and um, with big background. Mm. And that is important because each day without triumphs and military victories, destroying official world view that probably our economy is not this well because of Yankees, of course. And Britain, Anglo-Saxons, they, you know, affect us hardly. Uh, and probably democracy is uh, not Fair, uh, is not um, ready. There are some problems, probably, but what is really cool, it's our army. We, if we can be proud of something as a nation, that is our army. And each day shows that army is much more likely 
on all other spheres of Putin's Russia. It's partly fake news. It's corrupted. Uh, soldiers and officers of that army got not enough food because of bad uh, logistics. They probably fight not bad sometimes, but they do not have weapons and uh, food. And then also very important new that our army looks like it looked 1914. Then Russia was a peasantry country. And of course, army was a peasants in military dress. Today, Russia is one of the most urbanized countries of Europe. 80% of Russians uh, uh, lived in cities. But if you will look in list of victims whose names we knew, you would be surprised. More, more than half of them are from villages. There is no villages, but they are still from the last, the rest. That's why the villages are more usual in uh, depressive national republics. Not only Chechnya, Dagestan, and Kafkaz, but also Buryatia in Eastern Siberia. Mm. And that's why Russian world is defending now with a and no, with an extremely big scale by national mi minorities. Because of their poor from the their poorest from the poor, and they have to sell their sons and uh, you know themselves, their bodies as a cannon, what do you say? Um, cannon fodder. Again? Cannon fodder. Cannon fodder, right. I knew that uh, word, cannon fodder. And then suddenly the flagman of the Russian Black Sea fleet disappeared. Something was wrong with uh, uh, the radars. Why? And just probably because, you know, in March there was a, <clears throat> two generals got a prison sentence because they stole 70% of budget for new weapon. The honest man in Russia could not stole more than half, according like every day's understanding. But they stole 70. So, of course, that uh, form of triumph of Russian weapon every day destroy propagandistic mythology. Mm. And um, if it would, just a second, it became that. Uh, if it would come to military defeat, of course it would destroy this, I would not say pro-war mobilization, but pro-war faked loyalism. As it had happened many times in Russian history. Yes. I just remind that Crimean War, when your compatriots uh, also attack our, our holy motherland, uh, Crimean War provoked peasantry revolution. And the result of that peasantry revolution was abolition of the slavery. Mm -hmm. Russian Japanese war provoked the first Russian revolution. The first world war provoked the second and third Russian revolution. Chechen war provoked the in 90s, first Chechen war provoked the huge political crisis, mm -hmm. which was covered with a big help of uh, John Major, mm. Bill Clinton, and all leaders of so-called democratic world. But of course, that is a real threat for regime, and they understand it. Mm. But looks like they are not able to do something with this.
Yes. Can I? It's it's it's. It, 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 you, you mentioned there the 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 the, the, the so-called democratic world, and that seems a, a suitable moment for me, if I may, to 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 move on just from the immediate military uh, situation, if, if I may. If, if you don't mind, I, I want to add one important, more concrete thing. Okay, go ahead, and then I'll ask my question. Uh, it's official information, so I, I do not uh, disinform you about Russian military abroad. Russia uh, forcing that uh, special military operation with a peacetime army. So army of the peacetime, mm. it's about 150 to 100,000 uh, people. The common army is around million, but not all of them able to fight. <clears throat> uh, in the front line, it's something in between 150 and 200,000 of people. In Ukraine, I, I, I'm not allowed to speculate about the level of uh, uh, victims, how many were killed. And I have no real picture. It's a fog of the war. Mm. But seems it's thousands. Even according to official information, it's more than thousands. And According to Ukrainian sources, it's 20,000 killed. Uh, then, look what is going on. It could be quite important. From the first day of that operation in Ukraine is going mobilization. Under four or five months, that mobilization would give to Ukrainian leadership half million army and your government and all other mm, western governments are sending weapons as we knew but russian russian party of the war let's say nationalists the extremists they demand from the first day mobilization but leadership is scaring to make mobilization mm. Because mobilization is something very material. It's one situation when you meet interviewer from sociological agency and you answer yes with, you know, maybe yes, maybe no. And totally as a picture, when uh, officers came to your apartment and call you to army, With a okay, with an impressive level of offers of of uh, victims. Mm -hmm. um, then, as always, Putin regime is scaring to make some real step. They're trying to continue with that uh, Hitlerist postmodernistic spectacle. But if they will lose military lucky now in Donbass, then they would not have tools to keep even, you know, stable front. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how would society react if one of regions of Russian Federation would be occupied. Okay. Um, thanks for that. That's very, very interesting. Um, um, going back uh, just a moment mm. to the question mm. I was going to ask you, which was you mentioned the so-called democratic world. And, and, and therefore, I just want to move on a bit, if I may now, to, to going beyond the immediate military situation. Um, where Russia is clearly obviously the aggressor, military aggressor on the ground, to the wider geopolitical situation. I thought I would uh, it'd be interesting to see what you think, um, where we in the West see NATO um, as being uh, you know, geopolitically aggressive by 
since 1999, as I'm sure you know, recruiting 14 new member states in Eastern Europe to it. And here in the UK, the anti-war movement, the Stop the War Coalition has been, you know, it's unequivocally condemned the invasion, but in opposition to the UK government, we've been working as hard as we can to highlight NATO's role in contributing to, to the war on the basis of the principle that for us here, the main enemy has to be at home. So my question is this really, how do you see the wider geopolitical context of NATO expansion and how you see it relates to this war? And would you agree with the principle um, here that guides us in, in the anti-war movement in the United Kingdom, that for us, the main enemy is at home, and that's very important uh, for both our movements. You're in Russia, so your main enemy has to be Vladimir Putin, what he's doing. We're in the UK, and for us, our main enemy has to be the United Kingdom government and the way it's contributing to the to uh, to the war and and its own with its own warmongering and its supply of arms. What, what what's your feeling about all that? I have been in your shoes. I lived six years in Sweden, and as a person of left views, uh, I wrote to the mainstream media, reported from the first crisis in Ukraine from Maidan. Yes, and I was recognized by the pro NATO media and pro NATO environment as a Putin agent. Still, all my friends were in Putin's prison at this time. It was a criminal case against me. But so I've been, I even I have a paper from Swedish Secret Service that I am is hypothetical threat uh, against the national security. Mm -hmm. So I've been in that position. And I share your uh, reflection of uh, NATO. British and American Putin is NATO. <laughs> yes. Uh, but let me begin from the easiest thing is that Vladimir Putin now presented indulgence. Do you know this word indulgence? The Catholic Church assault in middle ages like excusation of all thieves yeah indulgences yes i know indulgence yes. In yeah that's indulgence. Indulgence. indulgence that's correct so yes. vladimir putin present intelligence for all you know extremists for all not uh, hawkers or birds of war for all for all who looked like a city idiot who shot in for years, Russia will attack, Russia will attack, and we will like, look, he's a mental challenged person just. Mm. Now he presents to Ukrainian nationalists who are real force and real threat against Ukrainian society, first of all. So Putin presents them accusation and, and indulgence, and, and indulgence, yes. Indulgence for all of them. And no excuse for Vladimir Putin for that. Mm -hmm. Of course, Vladimir Putin for years made the geopolitical position of Russia much, much worse. Sweden, after more than 200 years of neutrality, hypothetically being the part of NATO. I was fighting against this some years in my life. You know, but let's start. Then. But same time, I think that geopolitical perspective is a worst thing for especially left-wing people, for Marxist and anti-war and even just democratical people of the world. Geopolitical perspective is just fake perspective, which always like provoke the wrong answers on the wrong questions. Uh, according to mainstream Western uh, description, war in Ukraine is geopolitical conflict between uh, Russian imperialistic reconquista and like democratic world order. I do not agree with that analysis. Russia 
of course now Russia is fighting for kind of imperial goals, but the real mold, the real um, goal, main goal of Putin was not geopolitics. If you would look like, if you would look on his history, what he began from, he began from the question, he in his night speech on the morning of 24th of February, he reminds that um, uh, case. He began as a president with a discussion with Clinton when he asked if Russia will join NATO, won't you be my hand against? Um, and first two or three years, his real goal was to join NATO. Condition and the problem why Russia did not join NATO and, and did not participate in occupation of Iraq, for example, was that there was kind of uh, kind of uh, conditions of Russian ruling class, conditions which were almost routed by West. So West, 1993, support Yeltsin with military anti-democratic coup when they shut at parliament from tanks. Then all John Major and Clinton and Karl Bildt of Sweden and Helmut Kohl in Germany, all big Democrats, they supported. So Russian ruling class recognized that West is cynic ruling class, which used democracy as an ideological cliche for idiots. And then, you know, business as usual. Then 1996, West helped to Yeltsin falsificate elections and made a fantastic brainwashing in order to suppress communist opposition. Then in 99 and 2000, West you know, bless the drone keeps drone keeping operation when Putin got his power from his patron Yeltsin. Is it fucking monarchy? But in Putin's eyes and eyes of ruling class, yes, it's monarchy. It's probably oligarchic regime where big seniors you know, like in Middle Ages, discuss who will be next king, then ask Amash to big senior in Washington. You know how Putin called uh, George Bush? He called him military emperor, military emperor of the world, according to rumors, political rumors. So that was very clean rules of the game. And then there is a like nice countries like Saudi Arabia. Let me be called Saudi Arabia with the same structure of property and power. We will be not the main. We will make a mush to big white Mr. Master in Washington. But then let us, we are also respectable ministers here. So let us decide who will be our king. That was condition, guarantees of property and power to the ruling class. 2004, there was red line when West, interrupt in the post-Soviet political life and help to Ukrainian oligarchs organize a kind of orange revolution. What we knew is the orange revolution. And that was a clean message to Putin. No, we will decide and you will just follow. And if you will not follow our orders, our uh, like, rules of the game, we will punish you. 
as uh, that um, Salvador, uh, I forget his name, that Spanish uh, judge who sentenced Pinochet. Democracy is not democracy of people, but democracy is a tool where Western oligarchy have the last word in all corners of the world. And Putin said, no, guys, you know, I have nuclear weapon and quite a big military industry. And from 2000, end of 2004, start all that um, process, which we knew as a Putin regime. They forbid uh, elections of governors because governors and local elites looked on the West. They had uh, those money in the West, Western banks. So they looked on the West. No, guys, you have to look just on Kremlin. Then they start to fight with the liberal opposition. They uh, uh, took over control parliamentary elections. Then finally, it was Georgia 2008. Then it was the uh, München speech 2007. Then it became military reform uh, in the end of uh, 2000. Then it was Ukraine 2014. So, and it was in turn, it was like, let's say, social order, conflict for the rules in neoliberal social order, which led us to the war. And then look on la last 10 years, what had happened? Russia became an almost feudal society where almost all members of government are sons and daughters of the closest Putin's friends. Like uh, Secretary of uh, Security Council Patrushan, his son is agricultural yeah. minister. Like son of the chief of Kremlin administration, Kirienka, he is a chief of main uh, IT corporation of contact and so on. And then even according, according research, uh, there was research of 10% of most wealthy uh, citizens of big cities. 70% of them took those, their profession and professional position by heritage. 70% of upper middle class of big cities. So Russia became a society of um, like, you know, dynastic doctors, chief doctors, dynastic um, judges, dynastic uh, generals, and so on. Such society could not grow, grow in economical sense. There is no any social uh, lift. There is no social mobility. So if you born in a poor family, you will die as a poor. Mm. If you born in a general family, you will die as a general. Northern Korea or uh, old order before French Revolution, very stable society, but then it does not grow. What to do in not growing society with, uh, let's say, nobility? You have to buy their loyalty. And that's why corruption was this big, because it was systematical institute, which it was just buying of loyalty. But if it does not grow, then conflict for property and uh, rent would be more and more that we had some big cases when like Khabarov's governor, local big oligarch, but local, was sentenced to prison just because of Kremlin oligarchy want to eat his bread, want to eat his factory and, you know, port to export metal to China. Um, so to the, and we, we just see Russian state budget is quite stable, but Russian regional regions budgets are bankrupt. During two years of COVID, 
of COVID, they had 10, not billiard, but after billiard, trillion. They have 10 trillion rubles of incomes and 15 trillion rubles of spendings. They got four trillions from federal budget, not enough. One and a half trillion, not enough. That made rent of local elite less. And, and abroad in Belarus, less. And if rent is less, so much less is loyalty. And then more and more often, Russian authorities have to use violence to keep order, to keep loyalty, as they did in Khabarovsk, as they did in Belarus during 2020 crisis. Yes. So open violence as a last argument in any you know, ruling class uh, discontent. But violence, if it is usual, institutionalized, according to that violence grew up party of what now is party of war. Those people, bureaucrats, propagandistic idiots, uh, military idiots as well, whose budget is violence, who, whose career is violence, whose fight for property and influence inside the regime is violence. So they created the war party. Mm -hmm. During COVID, it, it, you know, became the flower. It blooms through the... Yeah, I don't yeah. know the uh, English word. Yeah, yeah. No, Swedish. So Indeed. it was social evolution of society of extremely inequality and suppression, which led to the war, not geopolitical shit. And I mean, Western uh, imperialism, which is reality. Yes. Of course. It's just repeating Russian tragedy. It's coming to the war from other perspective, but with the same reasons and the same social mechanism. Yes, yes. Now, I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I take your point. I mean, there are clearly, in, there's an internal dynamic to this war, clearly in Russian society, that's what you're saying there, is rooted in the determination of NATO to expand. I mean, it's the coming together of these different dynamics that is creating the crisis um, uh, in Ukraine. I wanted to, can I just, uh, time is now beginning to run a little bit short. So I wanna mm. come to my last question, if I can for you, Alexei. Um, and it's this really, um, I, I, I think it's probably, I mean, I hope you'd agree with me that it's probably fair to say that whatever the final outcome of the war in Ukraine, and we don't know what it's going to be, but whatever it is, it's clear that we are kind of moving into an even more dangerous, an even more militarized phase uh, of competition between the uh, powers like the United States and NATO on the one side uh, and Russia, but also, of course, I suppose, potentially, we can see this now developing is, is, is China as well. Now, uh, to, uh, I'm just thinking about this. To, to counter all this for the anti-war movements in our respective countries is to think about organizing an international anti-war movement that can campaign, that can mobilize against these futurely coordinated way. Because it seems to me that we have to have, because of this, the, the, we need an international anti-war movement rooted in each nation, of course, but that cooperates and can react quickly to these conflicts as and they arise. What is your feeling about that? Yes, um, I agree that we, are, we came already to extremely dangerous point. War already had begun. But there is a very small reason 
to keep hope because this war discredited in Russia Vladimir Putin and his circle and his type of statehood, but also all ruling class and all institutes and rules of the world which they have built during all that 30 years. It became clean that if they would not push on the red button, nuclear button, button mm -hmm. and we survive as a human being, then this war will not finish. It could be stopped on a pause, but would not finish until Vladimir Putin and his oligarchy sitting in Kremlin. So it shows very clean uh, alternative what had to be done. I am sure that not this soon, but it also been clear in the West, in Western societies, that it was not just collapse of Russia and Russian state building. It was collapse of all European security system, including NATO and Euro Union. It was collapse of that political system, which called democracy, but let's say new liberal democracy does not work anymore. And I, uh, we work together with uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon in France. Mm -hmm. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, carry on. Uh, um, and his result on these elections was impressive. Mm -hmm. He was alone and uh, collect 22% of voices. So I guess that feeling and that understanding is already coming. Of course, first would be the most reaction. The right wing busters, they would take over now both in Russia and West. But very soon, millions of people would be disappeared. Poverty and inequality uh, would not disappear, would be here with us and would be working class who would pay for that bloody crime. Then I am totally sure that as 100 years ago, we need new Zimmerwald. Hopefully, hopefully, without Bolshevik extremism, because the experiment works not this well as uh, they hoped. But what we really need, we need to repeat the success of radical socialists who understand, they are quite few, but they understand very clean what have to be done in order to stop that crime, to stop that war, unlimited war, that it could not be done without social transformation, deep and very radical transformation. Mm -hmm. And to unite that demand of social transformation and peace is a recipe which left have to present to people. You know, I, we are very weak. And I know Jeremy Corbyn, not anymore the leader of uh, opposition of Your Majesty, unfortunately. Yes. Unfortunately, yes. We hope on him as a leader of all European left for years, but it shows that just naive reformism collapsed. We have to be more radical, I guess, and war forces us to be more radical. Uh, <clears throat> we are now members of uh, Council of Progressive International together with Jeremy. Yes, I've been in yes. some conference with him. He's a legend for me. So I was proud. <laughs> yes, yes. So yes, and we are working together with our with Progressive International and with our French comrades from Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Personally with him and his like, comrades. With Democratic Socialist of America, on a new Zimmerwald, you know, Zimmerwald conference during World War II. Of course, of course, of course. So yes, that, that what we need really. And now our 
communication is very, you know, extremely bad, extremely bad. Uh, yesterday, Podemos organized a peace conference in Madrid and it was very naive and quite stupid. And it was me who called them to organize it and I didn't knew that it would happen. So we have to make stronger our connections, our communications, and then organize the road map to peace. Because nobody understands how peace is able now. Military victory of Russia over Ukrainian government, would it make peace? No way. No. Military victory of uh, NATO and Ukraine over Russian army, would it make peace? Or probably a nuclear war. No peace without equality, without Indeed. radical democratization. And in the market of peace, radical left are monopolists that could make us much stronger. We have on to that on that on that absolutely brilliant point, if I may say so, Alexei. I I'm going to have to um, bring the interview to a close, but I want to say uh, I can't imagine a better way of ending an interview than the way you've just ended it with the call that you have made. So I want to say to you, thank you once again for, for finding the time to talk to us today. And I really do hope and I agree completely that these discussions and the wider discussions that we're all having will help to develop exactly the better relations, the better communications that you are talking about between our respective lefts, between our respective socialists and our anti-war movements. You're absolutely right on that. So I could Hope not so. agree. So my final me my Dragon, message to you, my final message. One personal ask. Yes. Um, uh, I'm a member of a coalition of socialists against peace. And most part of us are just, you know, Moscow intelligence. Some of us were journalists, as me and a friend of mine. And now there is no media anymore in Russia. So I, I still keep part of my work and my salary. But some of my comrades does not really already now. So if it would be any opportunity to me or our comrades to publish normal media publications, analysis or reports from Moscow and Russia, <clears throat> it would be very helpful mm -hmm. because of, you know, honorar from British paper is uh, a week or two weeks of surviving in uh, Russia now. Uh, I am quite familiar with uh, media. I worked now. I am. I will write to to the British Jacobin Oi Tribune. Ah, uh, Tribune. You mean Tribune? No, no. Thomas Magazine. But oh, the Jac Jacobin. Yeah, I, I have been published in the Jacobin many times. Yes, but yes. If yes. it would be possible to invite me or my comrades this publication absolutely very I'm sure, I'm sure that will be possible and certainly um we can we'll be looking into that and i'm absolutely sure that the exactly the voices that you are um uh, expressing here today is what we want to hear in the west as well and that will be absolutely crucial so just to end uh uh this alexei i just want to say solidarity to you Thank from you. london from London, <laughs> um, um, from the anti-war movement here, from the left in this country. Uh, we know what you can expect is gonna be hard in the coming weeks and months. We understand that, but uh, we want to make it clear to you that we are with you and we're on your side. So th thanks again. Thank you, it's very important again to for hear. this interview. Thank you, thank you.